one of the things that was such a issue for me was finding a healthy relationship after yeah. leaving. So we'll be talking about that a lot in this episode. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you are new here, my name is Amanda Ray. And when I was 17, almost 18 years old, I left a polygamous cult that I was born in. If you're interested in hearing more about that story, I will leave the links to my story in the description box down below. But today I am interviewing Shalise from Cults hey. to Consciousness. <laughs> and she, she's she been on the channel before. And we also do have, I'll link down below our live streams that we have together. And then the episode that's going to be on your channel as well. Yeah. So definitely after this episode, go check out her channel. She's got a lot of really good interviews on there. Um, we're going to be talking about Shalise's background in the Mormon community. The mainstream Mormon community. Yes, mainstream. Not not FLDS, but like <laughs> LDS. Yeah, I was thinking, is, is her audience going to want to hear about something that's like half as interesting as the order <laughs> but so many people who have come from lds belief really gravitate towards right. what, what i talk about so i feel like they'll find a lot of um comfort in your story okay. and like i found a lot of comfort in it it's very similar the deconstruction part yeah the patterns so, are the same right so we'll be talking about a lot of that but we i also do want to talk about your relationship now what we're going to be you guys get a real treat you get to mm -hmm. actually talk with or or see her now partner yeah so i'm gonna be husband. he's mm -hmm. not little <laughs> my, my little husband, husband. pocket size <laughs> <laughs> he's in my pocket right now um but yeah so so stay till the end because i'm going to be asking them some relationship questions but let's first start with i'm going to kind of interview you like you're a mormon still okay <laughs> which is this, this a bishop's interview right but that's <laughs> way like better a, though the wrong term right i'm you're you're a mormon now d d i heard that you weren't supposed to call them mormons oh right, right. yeah the <laughs> it's funny it's basically a marketing scheme and we know this because there was a source who talked to john delin from mormon stories who worked for or works for the marketing team in the mormon church and they decided not to call themselves Mormon anymore because it's such an easy Google and all of the converts were like Googling, should I be Mormon? And overwhelmingly it's no, it's, there's a lot of fraud in there. So now they're very adamant that they are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and they are LDS, Latter-day Saints, oh, not okay. Mormon. So they're offended when you call them that, but they're also offended when on my channel, when we call the like your group the order mormons because they're like they're not real mormons i'm like girl you don't own that word <laughs> and you, ca so, you can't please everybody you can't win <laughs> when lds people would get upset with me and because i've gotten the same kind of hate like we are different we came from the true teachings of joseph smith mm -hmm. we were actually living the polygamy that you guys chose to stop living yes so um they did it better you did better. That's what I mean. The As in they. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, yeah, consecration and polygamy was the two things that your church had fallen away from. And right. we kept true to the belief system. So I'm kind of curious, um, talking about the Mormon belief system, did you know a lot of Joseph Smith and the polygamy aspect, like the history of Joseph Smith? I remember specifically one time in Sunday school. No, it was young women's because that's when they have to bring it up when they're teaching you how to be a good wifey. So I think I was... 12 or 13, I remember being really young and the lesson comes up about polygamy and they didn't really talk about Joseph Smith being a polygamist, but this is how they portrayed it to us. And channel disclaimer, everything that I talk about is my experience. You may not have grown up this way if you are a current Mormon or ex-Mormon. This is all based on growing up mm -hmm. Mormon in Utah in a very small town. So anyways... We got this lesson about polygamy, and they would say, oh, it was so wonderful. The men had to go off to war. I don't even know what war, if that was even real at the time. Had to go off to war, and all of these poor women were just left alone. These damsels in distress. And so these men were just taking in these women and saying, oh, I'll take care of you, and don't worry. And that was not the story, guys. That is mm -mm. not what happened at all. And so that was my view of polygamy, like, wow, how amazing for those men to take in those women. And then the lesson was, okay, so that was before, like, we don't do that anymore. You'll be excommunicated if you practice polygamy, mm -hmm. which is why when people would ask me, are you from Utah? Yeah. How many moms do you have? I would get so mad because I'm like, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that people were still doing that. <laughs> Anyways, because they didn't even mention the fundamentalists. Like you guys weren't even a thought because they didn't want to acknowledge that people still did wow. it. That's my suspicion. Yeah. So I didn't even know people were still doing that. Anyways, 
So they said, but when you get to heaven, it is an eternal thing that, you know, you have to practice polygamy in heaven. I was like, have oh, to? hell no. Basically, they were wow. saying that when you get to heaven in the celestial kingdom, that's how you're going to repopulate the earth that you are given because you're going to be having a lot also- of angel sex. <laughs> That's yeah, a, that never made sense to me. Like, so we're <laughs> earthly human bodies that are going to be doing the same earthly stuff in heaven. Yes, because they believe that you are resurrected with your full flesh and blood body that is made to perfection. So any, t- I remember thinking, oh, this scar will be gone and this scar will be gone, and I hope that this happens when I get there. Whatever. Whoa, I was a kid. that's a Mormon. So teaching. we believe that too. I didn't yeah. know that was from Mormon teaching. So when you get to heaven, if you get to the highest level, which I was an A plus student, so I was like, obviously I'm going to make it. When you get there, you have to practice polygamy to repopulate this planet that you are given which they've also redacted recently there was a whole faq section that they put up on the website saying um do mormons believe they get their own planet after they die and they're like no we've never taught that everyone was like are you kidding me because that's the whole point in becoming a god is (laughs) you you get to the celestial kingdom and then you become a god over your own world so then you are god you (laughs) are god it is extremely blasphemous to any christian religion well we're the goddess yeah we're married to the god (laughs) but guys this is where it gets funny and this is why i was so mad in this lesson is because they said that we would be repopulating our planet right but you have a physical body so your job is to be eternally pregnant to have billions of children to populate your planet with other women (laughs) that are sharing your husband but and Good news is you won't have stretch marks because you're in your <laughs> perfect form. <laughs> I mean, and we know that it's real, physical, regular sex because the prophets have said, and even recently in the last general conference said, that if you make it to the lower two kingdoms, you won't have genitals. What? So we know that it's like actual sex, eternal sex and eternal um, pregnancies in order to populate. And I'm just thinking pregnant for that sounds awful yep and you're forced to practice polygamy so anyways they say that polygamy is an eternal thing that you can't really get away from and they also taught they taught that if i get married and i get married in the temple on earth and then i die my husband can get remarried and Mm -hmm. get sealed to another woman and i have no choice like we're automatically gonna all be a happy family when we die and i remember thinking I will never, like, I will make sure I don't die as if I have any control over that. Because <laughs> I remember as a child, really, being so worked up about it. I was yep. like, oh, hell no, is that going to happen to me? But if my husband were to die and I were to meet someone new, I couldn't be sealed to him. Yep. And I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, because I never made it this far, guys. Um, I could get permission from the quorum of the 12 or the prophet or whoever has to sign off on it to get unsealed from the first husband and get resealed to the new one so let's say i got married and it was a horrible abusive relationship and i wanted to get out of it and i don't want to be with this guy for eternity making spirit babies forever so i want to get out of that and be sealed to someone else i think you can get permission but you can't be sealed to more than one man right obviously the men can. polygamy thing yeah mm-hmm. wow i did not know that they were still kind of teaching that stuff to the i guess you were also utah mormon yeah and i do feel like it's more prominent like i worked for a dentist in utah that flat out got very triggered by me because he knew where i came from mm-hmm. and we started to talk about the doctrine and covenants and he flat out was like we will be living polygamy in the afterlife in a work meeting so i was like okay well, i always thought it was the older generation that believed that Because even my adopted family was like, no, we don't believe that. But there's a lot that do. Oh, they believe it. So here's the funny thing. And I've noticed this. There's a huge variance, a huge gradient among Mormons. You have the ones who know the doctrine and are really obsessed with it. And like, these are the rules and we have to follow them. And then you have the ones that are just like, yeah, I just go to church because it feels good. And like, Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. Who said that Mormons believe that? It's literally because they just don't know that's what they're supposed to believe. Yeah. Or they choose not to. They choose to cherry pick, even though the prophets have said you literally can't do that. It's all or nothing. So there's a big gradient of people who will say or try and discount and be like, oh, that's not even a thing. But I was one of them where I just didn't know things were a thing. I didn't know about race and the priesthood. I was just never taught that. And so it becomes really problematic when you leave and people try and give you this information, this correct information, and you are taught 
because of the information control within Mormonism, you are taught to ignore it and you are taught to discount it because anything mm-hmm. that makes the church looks bad, look bad is anti-Mormon. It's propaganda. Right. It's lies. They're tra- it's just trying to take down the church. And so you can't even open yourself up to the possibility that that's even a thing, even though it's on the church website, if you look hard enough. Yep. L- LDS.org, you can find you yes. can find that Joseph Smith married a 14-year-old. Mm-hmm. It's all on there. And so I had this issue actually with Mormons, not Mormons, sorry, missionaries. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know how many wives Joseph Smith had? And they didn't even know. And I was like, LDS.org. <laughs> <laughs> Let me help you. The amount of times I've had to link that in the comments to active Mormons that are like, I can't believe you're spreading this misinformation. It's so wrong. And then I just link the website. <laughs> Like, why don't you you give it a read? Here you go. I kind of have, now that we're on this topic of like the belief systems, the crazy belief systems, I just came out with this video actually um, about, so we talk about the leader, the the starter of the order dying and they thought he's going to be resurrected for the second coming. What did you guys believe in as far as the second coming goes? So the second coming, it was very prominent, but some took it more serious than others. So you have the... Do you guys have storage units with canned goods and like 72 hour kits? We definitely, we believed that a lot of the order members believed the world was probably going to end when the Mayan calendar ended in 2012. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, it's in the name, guys. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Joseph Smith said, Jesus is coming in this generation. So people were literally thinking, okay, the world is going to be. In the latter days. fire. (laughs) Yeah, in the latter days. And so every prophet since Joseph Smith has said that, these are the latter days, the last days, the latter days. And so it really is an apocalyptic church. Mm -hmm. You are believing in the end times. And so we had this huge storage in our basement with all these canned goods. I remember going to the canning factories owned by the church and canning dried potatoes and (laughs) potato flakes. And eventually my mom would be like, should we go get some of those potatoes because we need to eat. And it's like, why are we saving this food down here? Yep. It's just going to go bad. We like we, Why did we buy all of this food? And it's also <laughs> kind of funny. This is what we learned. So I was taught that when the last days came, none of this makes any sense, which is why it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> when the last days come, maybe it's the apocalypse. I don't know. Maybe Jesus hasn't descended from heaven yet. But we are supposed to take all of our food storage and take it to our church, our like brick and mortar church everyone brings what they have Mm -hmm. and then it's going to be distributed amongst everybody like communism and i'm thinking then why are we preparing why are we buying all the food if Mm -hmm. we could just show up and get yeah food from somebody else but then i learned later from uh an extended family member who's kind of in the prepper movement i learned from her kids who are no longer mormon that she was told if you show up to the church with nothing, they're going to turn you away. Oh. So if you don't come... At least bring with, one can. <laughs> you, here's a can of beans. If you don't come with anything, you don't get any share of it. So everyone is expected... So here's the hole. Here's the plot hole in this. They also teach about the millennium. That's what they call it. The thousand years of paradise or whatever. That when Jesus comes down, if you're... <laughs> this is so terrifying. If you're not Mormon you will be burned alive. Everything on the planet will be burned up. And I'm thinking, Mm -hmm. even the animals? Yes, gone, wiped out. This is what I was taught. Could be different in your church, I don't know. So everyone will be burned except the righteous Mormons. So Mm -hmm. also, you could be Mormon and unrighteous and get burned alive. The righteous will be literally lifted up from the earth, Mm -hmm. like on a cloud or something. And once the earth is all burned to a crisp, God will make it paradise and then drop us back down like in the Garden of Eden. And we will live Satan free for a thousand years. So Satan will be locked up somehow. I don't, this is such a funny like mythology here. Because he didn't um, have the canned food. <laughs> he didn't survive. <laughs> so, but that's where the hole is. So if that's what's happening, our canned food is going to be gone before we even... <laughs> Like, we won't even need the canned food by the time we're... That's why I was just going to say, like, why do you need the canned food then? No, you you're not going to need the canned food. It's going to be burnt up in the fire. So <laughs> there's a lot of holes here. But that's what we were taught. So end times mentality. Mm-hmm. And you had to be righteous or else you were going to get burnt up. And that is terrifying for a child. Yep. Oh, yeah. And you're you're not learning this as an adult. You're learning as a, as a growing child. Like, uh-huh. oh, my gosh, I better be a good little girl. Better or repent. <laughs> I'm going to burn in the flames. Mm-hmm. And it's such a... Sadly, it's smart because if you have someone 
living in fear they're not thinking rationally so a lot of the times the guilt and all of the what did we talk about we said guilt, guilt and, shame and fear yeah guilt shame and fear um it's easier to manipulate someone when they're when they're living in fear for mm -hmm. like because you're just not thinking with your rational brain anymore so it's interesting to see that that was a very big part of lds believe very big part of our belief same thing like we i have had nightmares even still of like the end of the world happening and then i will go to like walmart and get tons like last time i did i got tons of the the 25 year shelf life and like water and this kid was like daddy what is she doing like it was scaring the kid oh my God. and he's like she's just going camping he's like calming she his kid down i'm like the end is coming <laughs> <laughs> which is why again there's just a huge range of mormons i mean there's so many of them millions right and so people take beliefs to the extreme where they don't so you have the ones who believe in the prepper movements mm. and they're really extreme about end times and you get into like Lori and chad daybell Lori val Lori Vallow, Chad Vallow. Vallow? I don't know. The, you guys know what she's talking about. <laughs> that chick who literally killed her kids because she said they were zombies. Yeah. So you get those extremes, and that's why people are just like, Mormons are a little bit crazy. Not There's a very huge chunk of Mormonism. I would say, like, if I had to guess, 70% of Mormons are just super normal people. Mm -hmm. Like, don't have any extreme beliefs. Don't right. know that they're supposed to believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. They don't know they're supposed to believe that the Garden of Eden is in New York or something. They don't know all of this weird stuff. And if you were to ask them, they'd be like, no, Mormons don't believe that. And I know that because I was one of them. And, mm -hmm. so, and so you get these extremes and then people get these differing opinions about Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing, though, is there's so much history on because well, in Utah alone, like you were saying, like people people now get excommunicated for living polygamy right in the church. But in Utah, it couldn't become a state because there were all the Mormons were living polygamy. Right. That's why it started. It wasn't even because it was a revelation. It was because they're not going to be a state and they're going to lose out on a lot of opportunities. So then they did start excommunicating polygamists. Mm -hmm. But then they also had I mean, there's all these weird rules like they couldn't. Uh, all races didn't hold the priesthood. Women couldn't hold the priesthood. I want to start talking about the vir like virginity, chastity. Oh, the purity yeah, stuff. Yeah, purity culture. Because I feel like we're very similar on this. Because in the order, you cannot have your first kiss to your wedding day. You can't hold hands till you're engaged. It has to be directed by God. They had this whole analogy of you have a present that's perfectly wrapped for your husband. And every time you flirt with a boy or kiss a boy, you're tearing that present. Really? Mm -hmm. Did they have anything similar? Oh, you guys? yes. Yeah, we had the chewed gum analogy and the licked cupcake analogy you and don't want to so, be a piece of chewed gum and so guys remember they are doing this in young women's class so by the time you are 12 you are getting these object lessons and i have to emphasize object lessons because they are literally comparing women to objects mm -hmm. they bring in cupcakes and i've heard many different variations of this and one of the leaders will grab one and like who wants a cupcake i want a cupcake and then because we're starving because it's probably fast sunday <laughs> and then <laughs> they lick it and they go who wants it now and everyone's like Ugh. you know mm -hmm. you would get the one sassy kid that's like i'll eat it <laughs> but they would say anytime you have sex before you're married you're a licked cupcake now or they would do that with gum and they would eat the gum and who wants it you're a chewed piece of gum now wow so what's so damaging about this and i've done entire episodes on my channel because it's so important to talk about is when you do that, the flip side of the purity culture is what if there is someone in that room who has been sexually abused and they're thinking, I'm a chewed piece of gum. Mm -hmm. No one's going to want me. And they had no choice in the matter, but it doesn't matter because your purity is everything. Your fate's already been chosen for you. Yes. Yep. And you feel like crap. And so purity culture on the surface may seem great. Sure, tell kids to wait till they're married. They won't have unwanted pregnancies. They won't get STIs. They won't whatever name your list of things that people think is positive about that, which can be positive. But on the other side, it's so damaging and it causes so much shame and it causes dissociation from your body when mm -hmm. you are too afraid. We were talking about this last night. You're too afraid to even wash yourself because you're not allowed to touch yourself. Yep. And so we don't even know what we got going on down there because mm -hmm. you also can't look at it. They advise you like, you know, it's best to just not really 
know what's going on. Like, don't take a mirror because why are you making yourself into walking? Uh, I don't want to get your video demonetized. Pornography. Um, walking porn on. <laughs> pornography. They said that stuff? <laughs> so, well, and women that's are basically the, mentality. the temptations for the men. Okay, so there was actually a quote. I think it was Gordon B. Hinckley. It was one of the more recent prophets one that I grew up with. So I grew up in Gordon B. Hinckley prophet time um, who said, ladies, why would you think that your knobby knees and bony shoulders are attractive to men? When you show that, you're basically walking pornography. What? Yes. On the same note, he's saying, um, but if you show your shoulders, you're going to be too tempting. So am I too disgusting or am I too sexy? Like, which yeah. one is it? Pick, pick a side. That's going to tempt the men into doing bad things, which and leaves no accountability for them. Exactly. That's where it gets really dangerous because then no accountability on the men. You made me do this to you. What mm-hmm. were you wearing when uh-huh. he chose to? He had, And then it's like the men have, this is the mind blowing part of it all. The men have no control over their urges, yet you're running the whole church. <laughs> exactly. We should be running it if you don't have that much control. Yeah. If, if we my have shoulder so is going to cause you to sin. You. Exactly. But also it's like, what about that Bible verse that says, if thy eye offend thee, pluck, pluck it, it out. out. Go pluck that. it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so honestly, if we're tempting you, it should be a, you need to be looking inward and plucking your eyes out. <laughs> yeah, but you don't see any one-eyed guys walking around. Exactly. So yeah, purity culture, extremely damaging. It's um, It creates this dissociation, like I mentioned, from your body where you don't even know what you like. You don't mm-hmm. know what boundaries are because when you have something that's so black and white, which is do not touch someone until you are married. Once you get married, let's say, you don't understand that you are allowed to have boundaries within a marriage. You don't right. understand that you can say, you know what, I like when you do this, but it really makes me feel uncomfortable when you do that. Right. You just think that you are owned by this mm-hmm. person now and that you are expected because to give anything and everything exactly and you're, you're like you were saying your body you're not even exploring your body you're not allowed no, to you don't know they, what you but like. your husband gets to he has more access to your body than you exactly. do exactly and then it creates this really dysfunctional i don't want to get too deep in this because it's going to get a little bit dark but we did not the term like marital grape <laughs> that's what tiktok okay. says <laughs> um that wasn't a thing and you when your husband wants it then he gets you're it. expected so i and i think that because of all of these crazy rules with men not being held accountable and women are responsible to please the man it starts to be you are just a servant for this man yeah and i also have to point out that it's really problematic for the men too it's not just the women because men aren't allowed to masturbate and right. so if they can't even please themselves or release whatever they want to release during the day they expect the woman to do it and Mm -hmm. so it creates this unhealthy cycle where they have needs too like just as women have needs which by the way if you're listening you need to know that you have needs too it's okay (laughs) to take care of yourself every now and then it's great there's so many benefits to masturbating yeah but it's also like why would god make it you able to have the i'm so (laughs) scared to say these words yeah the capacity of that if he didn't want you to be doing that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like, and also why can only men have that? And it's, it just creates this very unhealthy relationship with yourself. And then you're shaming and guilting yourself for being human. Mm-hmm. A lot of people have pointed out on our interviews that if you can control someone's sexuality, you can make them do anything. Yeah. Because it is a biological need. Mm-hmm. It is, I mean, I don't want to, let me work myself back here. If you are asexual, this probably doesn't apply to you and that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. But most people, it is very natural and normative is the term that I learned is normative because normal, who knows what normal is? It's normative for people to have these urges and it's, it's developmentally healthy to explore these urges. Right. So we had on a sex therapist, Natasha Helfer, who was excommunicated because she was telling her Mormon clients that it's okay to masturbate because she knew if she were to give them the opposite advice, her license could literally be revoked. It could be taken away for giving wrong, and I'm saying this truly honestly, wrong information and unhealthy information. Mm -hmm. 
So they excommunicated her and she was devastated. She's wow. like, I'm just trying to help these kids understand that they're not wrong or sinful or bad right. because they're doing something that it's been noted fetuses do this in the womb like it's normal to touch yourself and it's okay they do yes <laughs> I actually never heard that <laughs> apparently it's been seen and you'll see toddlers like touching themselves yeah. because it feels good there's an explorative and, phase that all kids go through but i yes. remember when kids in the order were going through it, they would they were very like stop that if you don't talk to your kids about sex you don't educate them about their own body and allow them to learn for themselves uh, they're more likely to be susceptible to sexual abuse. They're yep. more, and they're also more likely to not tell you because yep. of the guilt. Yes. You're going to be a parent that has no idea what's going on in this kid's life because they're so mm -hmm. terrified of and and guilty of these you know repercussions. Just like the yeah. chewed gum analogy, uh -huh. no one's going to talk about getting sexually assaulted because they're a piece of chewed gum. They don't want to be treated that way. So there was another apostle, and I think it was Spencer W. Kimball, but I need to uh, make sure. So. Their quote was, it is better to have fought, if you are being sexually assaulted, it is better to have fought and lost your life than to have lost your virtue without a fight. So wow. they're saying it's better to die while you are being, than lose your virtue, lose your virginity. So of course, the shame is so intense, especially when they say to us, and I remember this very clearly, that sex is a sin next to murder. Oh, my Premarital sex. I kid you not. So I, I remember fighting with my bishop. And we can talk about this. This is part of my exit story. I think we were mm -hmm. teasing yeah, I was it in gonna, the live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they make you feel so ashamed that, of course, you don't want to talk about it if, if you've been through a trauma. And I've heard of cases. People have written this in the comments that they went and told their bishop, this happened to me. And their bishop blamed them wow and basically said it's your fault and you need to repent for this for this happening to you yes for what being in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah <laughs> like, how are you supposed to repent from that exactly exactly wow. it's really backwards and that's the flip side of purity culture that it, i'm not okay with and i also have to say because people say this in the comments um there is nothing wrong with waiting till you get married to have sex if that is your choice if right. you are not coerced if you are not manipulated into mm -hmm. making that decision if you just want to wait until you are married i love that yep. do you boo like that's all you right i just don't think that it's okay to say abstinence only no education around sex, no education around anatomy. I didn't even know that there were only a few days a month, if your cycle is normal, that you can get pregnant. Right. I didn't learn that until I was an egg donor. And I was like, huh, this seems like good information to know. Because yeah. I was terrified of becoming a teen pregnancy. Right. Another statistic, I just remember thinking through high school, this was honestly a real fear. And no one had even put their hands on me at this point. I was like, oh my gosh, please don't let me get pregnant. Please don't let me get pregnant. Because... I didn't want to be a statistic. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be forced to give my child up for adoption because that's what they do in the Mormon church. They say, well, if you get pregnant, abortion's not an option unless they, they do say, because I looked it up one time because I was terrified, that if it was assault or incest, then they're okay with the abortion. Mm -hmm. If not, then you are forced to give it up. They're like, oh, well, I guess it's adoption. And these wow. girls in our school would just disappear for nine months and they oh went to go gosh. with their aunt for a little while and they would come back, different person, upset, obviously, yeah. because they were just forced to give away their child and not talk about it even. Right. So we need education. We need people who are willing to say, hey guys, here are your options. You're gonna get these sexual urges if you want to explore, be smart. Mm -hmm. This is contraception. This is how you get pregnant. This is how you contract STIs. These are the ones that are concerning. This is why you may want to wait until you find that special person. But just know that it's up to you. Whatever you want to do with your body is up to you. But Mm -hmm. educate them on their options right because more knowledge is power like the less knowledge they have then they're more susceptible to the teen pregnancies too and again i'll reiterate too extremes on both ends is bad like an extreme to be like don't don't be having sex till you're 40 and the extreme to be like go sleep go with everyone exactly yes. so to find and every person is different you could not feel comfortable till you're in your 20s or you could be a really explorative from a young age mm -hmm. so at the end of the day it's really just educating your kids and giving them trusting your kids to make the healthy decisions because yeah. 
I think what's the problem with these these cults is they don't trust their kids to yeah. be, you know, you're like so, you're so boasty about being so righteous, but you're not even trusting your kids to make the right decision. Yeah. So Because at the very least, just like you were saying, even if you're teaching your kids, hey, it's best to wait until marriage, there is a very good chance that something happens and they may be in a situation where they could get assaulted. And if they don't understand their anatomy, if they don't understand how sex mm-hmm. works, they could be assaulted and not even really realize it. And I right. know this, be- and it sounds extreme, but people that I interview on our channel, people who come out of the Amish communities, the Mennonite communities, the IBLP, that right. weren't even instructed on basic anatomy and body parts, didn't know that they were being assaulted for years. Right. They knew they didn't like it, but they're like, oh, that's where babies come from. They had no idea. Yeah. So even just educating your kids it is so baseline and so important to have those conversations from when they're really young and age-appropriate conversations I'm not saying explain sex to a three-year-old but I'm saying explain this is your body this is where people cannot touch you ever and if someone does let mommy know it's just so Mm -hmm. important right it's so true and this is you were just saying that this is one of the reasons why you exited yeah LDS church what was that was it the bishop having to confess to the bishop yeah so you, you can want we talk the about juice? this? You want well, the juicy story? For anyone that's not LDS, there's this weird thing where you have to confess your sins to the bishop, which means also sexual sins. So even yeah. if you're masturbating, like you have to tell the bishop, which sometimes it's teenagers telling grown ass men, yep. oh, I touch myself three times a week. It's like, yeah. that sounds like a breeding ground for pedophilia, especially for the fact that there's no other parent involved. And they're and not just, trained professionals, by the way. Right. They're just a random dude that was called to this position. They're not trained clergymen in the slightest someone just says yeah you should be bishop and then they're all of a sudden in charge of these very intimate their quote therapeutic conversations with kids Mm -hmm. because they ask you these questions as young as 12 wow and you oh my god were you going to the bishop once a week no 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 so i think when you hit 12 it's either twice a year or once a year but if you've sinned you go forward Like, you know that you have to confess. And Mm. that's probably the worst part is the guilt when you've done something wrong and you're like, oh, my gosh, I got to tell the bishop because I'm going to tell the bishops I'm going to get burned up in this second coming or (laughs) I'm going to outer darkness or whatever. And so you are self-policing, which is such a huge cult manipulation tactic, is getting people to tell on themselves. You know that you have major control when you can get someone to tell on themselves and do all of these things without someone even watching well so, so they're, yeah. they're their own little narc <laughs> <laughs> seriously so well in my case I didn't really have a choice so I was with someone I lived in Vegas at the time I was in the singles ward so only for the single people Mormon single people from 18 to 30 they kick you out after you're 30 which is really sad. And I was 19, still very Mormon, even though I was working at Hard Rock Hotel at Rehab, the day club. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you're like, I it love was, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it was televised at the time. And I'm over here thinking like, I'm going to spread the word to the sinners, you know, and <laughs> I just said them. really embarrassing things when I when I was there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I remember one time. Here's one of my embarrassing tidbits for you guys. I remember someone saying, um, wow, you live in Vegas. That's Sin City. Aren't you afraid of all of the sin? And I'm like, well, there are more Mormons in Vegas than in Utah, which was true at the time. I don't know if it is anymore because they settled Utah before the mafia came in anyway. And I said, there needs to be so many Mormons to balance out the sin. (laughs) So I'm doing an act of service. (laughs) I volunteers tribute to go and convert these sinners. So, oh, so you were like a goody goody <laughs> Mormon. So <laughs> but I'm wearing this string bikini to work because I'm a lifeguard and that was the uniform. And I'm like, oh, bummer. I have to wear a bikini to work, even though like I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to work on Sundays. It was mandatory. That was the televised day mm-hmm. of rehab. And I would rush home. So I would bring my church clothes with me and then I would change while I was driving. It was so unsafe. I was a teenager. I did stupid things. While I was driving into a dress, I probably still have my swimsuit under it, (laughs) put my dress on and make it to the last hour of church because I did not want to miss church because I was very devout. And so I'm with this guy for a year and, you know, 
we're dating for a year. Like, we're sleeping over at each other's house. We still Mm -hmm. haven't had sex. I'm still a virgin. And he convinces me to do oral sex. And I wanted to. But I was like, are you sure? Because I know what this means. Mm -hmm. This is a sin. We're going to get punished hard for this. And in the heat of the moment, he's like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And I'm like, okay. Immediately after, he's like, oh. We should go talk to the bishop. And I was like, "You're like now? <laughs> like, can we can we clean up? <laughs> yeah, right no, now? right now. Right now, <laughs> we need to show him what we've done." I was <laughs> so upset. I was like, "Oh my gosh, really?" I was so annoyed because here I am, dating this guy for a year, which is already way too long. Mormon standards. I should be married by mm-hmm. now, and I wanted to marry him. I was like, "This is so dumb. Why would I go repent when you're gonna be my husband? This makes right. no sense." And so. He sets up the appointment, and once one person confesses, the other one gets called in because it takes two. And it was one of the worst moments of my life. It was so shameful. I remember going in, and I was terrified. And so, guys, I'm 19. He's probably, like, late 40s, this guy. And I, the bishop. Guy. The bishop. Oh, for a second, I was like, your boyfriend? No. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Hold okay, on. so you're in there by Hold yourself. On. I'm in there by myself. I can still even remember what the office looks like and the sun coming through the window and me sitting in this chair and him behind this big old desk. And he's like, I'm really glad that you came in today, Shalise. And I'm just like, mm hmm. And he's like, so tell me what happened. And I have to tell, I have to describe what happened with me and my boyfriend in an intimate situation. And I start crying because I'm basically hyperventilating and this mm-hmm. is terrifying and I've just sinned. But I'm like, okay, I got this on my chest. You know, like, we're good. We're going to clear, clear this up. And he's like, I'm so glad that you told me. Um, yeah, he did mention that this happened. And I just want you to know, I, I do think that, you know, maybe you guys shouldn't be together because it seems like you're a bad influence on mm-hmm. him. You're the bad influence on him? I'm the bad influence. Wow. And I'm like, like hold on hold the phone i just did the right thing and this is not feeling like the right answer to right this. so we shouldn't have told you is what exactly. i'm getting exactly i've already talked to him about it and i just think that that's probably the right thing and i'm like what do you mean and he's just like you know i i don't think you're on the spiritual path right now basically said i'm not spiritual enough did your boyfriend agree he broke up with me Whoa. we did get back together for like a hot second that relationship was doomed to fail i was 19 it was dumb yeah but wow. anyways um he said that it was completely unnatural he goes oral sex is not okay it's completely unnatural it's found nowhere in the bible which i've had people in the comments be like it is in the bible which love you guys for that <laughs> um but i didn't know and wow. i was like wait 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 it's on that. I was like, it's just kissing on another part of the body. He's like, no, Shalise. It's much more serious than that. It is sex. I'm like, no, no. It is not sex because I'm still a virgin. And I'm just like very proud of this. Yeah. And he was like, oral sex is sex. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> because they say the reason that sex before marriage is a sin next to murder is because you're messing with procreation. And that's a very sacred thing. And I was like, can't get pregnant yep. with oral sex. It is not the same. And we fought about this. I stood up for myself briefly. Yeah. And then he just pounded me back down. Wow. And He's like, no, it is what you did is next to murder. So what he said was it's going to be a year without going to the temple. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Isn't that the punishment for intercourse? And he said, yes. And so that's where we were fighting because I'm like, it's not the same. Why mm-hmm. are you giving me the same punishment? You're I like, should have just might had have, sex. Yeah. Might as well have had <laughs> sex. I should have just had sex. And so, yeah, we got in this huge fight about it. And I also questioned his authority because I don't know if you know this, but the bishops are supposed to get the confession and then they're supposed to pray about it and through prayer find out what God wants their punishment to be. Mm -hmm. And he just flipped open this book and he was like, "Mm, oral sex, yeah, year without the temple, few months without taking the sacrament. And I'm like, aren't you supposed to pray about it? Yeah. (laughs) He was like are you questioning me? And I was like, yeah, Yeah. that's kind of your job as the bishop is to pray about it and get an answer from God, not your little notebook. Yeah. So by the end of it, he probably hated you. (laughs) Oh yeah, for sure. By the end of it, I was in tears, just feeling so low. He broke me down. I stood up for myself briefly. He broke me back down. I was just so upset. 
I left there crying. I get in my car. I call my mom and I'm like, I'm not spiritual enough. She was livid because she was Mm. like, you're the most spiritual person that I know. I was Mm. reading my scriptures every single night. I was having all of these spiritual experiences and these confirmations and I was devout and I wanted to get married in the temple. I was going to go to the highest level of heaven, which celestial telestial terrestrial and even in the celestial kingdom there's multiple levels there so i was like going to the top of the top of the top yeah and And now you're like what am i going telestial now i don't know (laughs) where am i going and also it's hitting me that i can't take the sacrament which is public humiliation right so for those that don't know it's the 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 bread and the water they pass the tray and it's very obvious when someone doesn't partake it's not like in other churches where you walk up and you form a line so people don't know like did they take it did they not you're all seated and they have this little tray someone passes it to you and I I even remember people people would drink it put it down and then grab the tray so someone's like holding it for you watching what you're doing yes so you're over there like (laughs) I'm I'm so full I can't (laughs) (laughs) I'm fasting (laughs) so yeah they would pass it down the rows because you're stuck in these rows and so the it goes down the row and passes it back and so if you pass it over yourself everyone goes sinner what did she do because you have to do something bad enough to get that punishment and it's usually sexual sin Mm -hmm. and so i'm just like this sucks yeah because not only did i want to marry this person now i'm supposed to break up with him now i'm not worthy enough now i'm not spiritual enough and he even tried to bring in my job and he was like what are the other things that you think you could be doing better in your life i i know that you work on sundays and i was like i have to work on sundays it's a requirement he's like well maybe you should think about getting a different job wow and sort of blaming me for all these things that i'm doing and so that was the first time I felt so low. This is my emotional break where I was like, you know what? That friend that I had up in Portland that had an intervention with me in her car about how Mormonism is a cult and all these things that are wrong with it that I didn't agree with because it was anti-Mormon propaganda. I'm just going to look into that again. Yeah. I'm just going to. She may have been on to something. She might have been on to something. So I did all this research. I stayed up all night. I was probably on my computer for eight hours. The sun went down. The sun came up. And I was like. Mormonism's made up. Whoa, <laughs> like, that's fast. Right. Because there were only a few things that I had to find to be like, oh, Joseph Smith is a con artist. And I was like, cool. So I was ready to find these answers. Mm-hmm. I was like, give it to me. And now I was actually open to receiving the answers. Whereas before, when I would be confronted with Joseph Smith, put his head in a hat. I'm like, no, he didn't. Yeah. He did, guys. That was a real thing. Mm-hmm. We were not Go- taught that. You can that. Google it and see the pictures, we the drawings. We were lied about. <laughs> lied to about this and now it's just so funny because a few years ago they actually had the prophet demonstrating with a hat and i'm like because they can't get away with it they finally have to admit it now that there's the internet and people can figure it out they're like see seer stones can fit into a hat (laughs) they're like trying to prove it (laughs) yeah wait did you hear that they're like they told you it's like a cell phone They're like, so imagine you have a cell phone and you're in the sun and it's hard to read your cell phone in the sun. But if you put it in a dark room, it lights up and you can read it. That's how they said the seer stone works is like a cell phone. Wow. So the seer stone is how Joseph Smith found the golden plates for people who have no idea what that is. Yeah. He was using it to find buried treasure or not find buried treasure. He conned people out of a lot of money and said, I can find treasure with this seer stone. The treasure's here. They dig, dig, dig. There's no treasure. Oh, it's because the spirit who was guarding it took it away because someone in here wasn't worthy. People paid him for that. Mm -hmm. And then he magically found golden plates and people weren't like, wait a second, he's been doing this for a long time. So I found out about the book of Abraham being completely wrong. And we know that because we have the actual transcript. Mm -hmm. We can translate Egyptian now. We know that that was completely wrong. That's the reason why I didn't join the LDS church. One of them, it was the Joseph Smith translated the papyrus. Papyri, yeah. Papyri, papyrus. papyrus. It's literally Egyptian text. Mm -hmm. And he claimed that he could, with the seer stone, interpret it. And it's in the Book of Mormon. It's the book of Abraham. Yeah, it's in the, it's a separate book 
there's like a few different books that comprise the Book of Mormon, okay. and then that's usually at the end, the right. Book of Abraham. So to give context, basically, uh, now that we have Egyptologists that have interpreted it, they're like, no, this is not It's right. a funerary text. But it's I told someone in the LDS church that, and they were like, well, no, he wasn't interpreting it Egyptology, like e- the Egyptian part, he was interpreting the, the spiritual meaning of it. Basically, so just anyone like can do that. inspired. <laughs> it was inspired, he didn't translate it. Yeah. So I was like, well, if he made that up, he definitely made the rest up. And then I found out about the multiple multiple versions of the first vision and how there's like eight different versions and the church uses a, some kind of middle one and they're all vastly different and mm-hmm. some Mormons know about it now and they're like oh no when you tell a story things change I'm like no he was saying one person came down and then he saw two different people like two they angels were very and, yeah. different yeah angels and then it's God and Jesus they were very different and I feel mm-hmm. like if you saw God it would be pretty much the same story every time you right. retold it so the more you research about joseph smith i i mean i feel like i was like so he was just really good at lying mm-hmm. and gaslighting he was the og narcissist <laughs> <He> was. <laughs> and we and we've created this whole lifestyle based off yes. of it like i am born because of it <laughs> it's this crazy polygamy. yeah and so am i i come from pioneer heritage um my mormon claim to fame is that my like fourth great grandma was the first woman baptized in england and then brought over and so it comes from both sides of my family like pioneer stock the whole Mm -hmm. thing so long line of mormons so yeah once i found out all that i was like oh i can leave and then i got into narcissistic relationships because they were very similar to the church and it was very toxic and it probably was very comfortable to be in a relationship with a man who's okay with being over you and telling you what to do and how to be and how to dress and yeah. You're like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is sounds nice. Good. Well, there was that push and pull, right? Because I just left the church. And so I'm like, I can wear shorts without shame. I can wear tank tops. This is Vegas, guys. I am not wearing shorts to my knees in friggin' 130 degree weather. And I didn't ever really feel bad about the modesty thing because it never made sense to me. And here I am going to school for fashion design. My bishop one time told me, this is a different bishop, one in Portland. He was like, I'm so happy that you're going to the fashion design so that you can design modest clothes. And in my head, I was like, Why'd who you think- said I'm going to do that? <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> we need a Mormon fashion designer to design some modest looking clothes. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> that's you're not like, going to Tell Patricia me. over there, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I was Just so glad that I never had to wear garments. I was never worthy enough. I didn't get to that point because oh. that would have oh I would have gone crazy because I loved my fashion and I didn't want to wear t-shirts under tank tops but yeah so the relationship thing it was very very rocky and I don't know how deep you want to go into it because I know you want to bring on my husband yeah but we can we can briefly talk about because because I did want to because I I've noticed on my channel that we've had a lot of viewers who really connected with me through my divorce video <clears throat> and talking about um that that like being attracted to narcissism being attracted Mm -hmm. to these unhealthy relationships and me and Shalise both have in common we've been in some relationship where we were cheated on and we felt really stupid but I think that a lot of that mindset was like we just didn't trust our gut trust our intuition Mm -hmm. and so how did you finally get to the point you are now in the relationship you are can we bring him on now yeah (laughs) oh yeah so should we say hi? You hey. want to say hi? Hello, my name is. <laughs> my name is. <laughs> what? My name is. What? My name is Jonathan. I'm the uh, the other half of Shalisa's heart. <laughs> hey guys. So Shalisa and I forgot to turn Jonathan's microphone on. So I tried to edit so that you could hear him better. But if it sounds like he's talking from like three hallways over, that's why. <laughs> Hope that it doesn't bother you too much. Sorry, Jonathan. Channel's very, um, we talk about a lot of traumas and abuse stories. So we just did an interview with you and I was saying how nice it is to be able to have some, some levity. Like joking just, around. Yeah, for <laughs> once, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. like, we've all had some traumatic pasts, but to be able to, I feel like I cope with laughing about it <laughs> because yeah. it's better to laugh than cry. Yeah. So. I do have, um, I'm excited for you guys to be able to actually deep dive into this relationship because I don't know that I've seen you guys really talk about your relationship. Mm. We don't know a lot about your background on this channel. Yeah. Do you want to briefly say a little bit, like you, you were Catholic at one point. Yes. Yeah, so I was Catholic. I was born and raised. Um, yeah, I just wasn't into it. It was a lot of like, yeah. <laughs> stand up, kneel, stand up, kneel. My mom, luckily, she wasn't very practicing, so... She um she was kind of down 
for me to not be into it. Wow. Um, yeah. And then um, you kind of were just, I, I have this, I have this question for you, but I'm going to ask both of you. Did you ever in your like journey of <coughs> spirituality, religion, whatever, go to a place of, I'm an atheist now. I don't believe in anything. No. So like I was mentioning earlier, I had a lot of spiritual experiences. And so I couldn't just be like, there's nothing out there because if anything, I feel like there's some sort of afterlife with all of the ghost stories and things that I've experienced. And so I couldn't just be like, it's black when we die. It just mm-hmm. didn't feel right or resonate with me. So I still felt that there was some sort of higher power or God, but I didn't see him as a dude with a white beard on a throne being like, you go to heaven, you go to hell. And right. it just didn't seem like, I also felt like it was kind of self-centered for humanity to be like, we're human and we're the best. So God is obviously human. I know they say like man is created in his image, but that could mean a lot of things. It doesn't mean he has to be a human. Just because we are the most intelligent species on this planet, it doesn't mean that the creator of all of the universe is also a dude. It just, Mm -hmm. I don't know, it seemed silly to me. It didn't sit right with you. Yeah. (laughs) I definitely leaned more atheistic when I was Mm -hmm. a teen. And I think I was overcorrecting from coming from where I came from, my background. So I... um, I, I thought I was a philosopher at the time, so I'm 15, and a lot of the gripes that we may have with religions now, I feel like I was going, I was having those discussions with friends at the time, and um, so, I, so as far as our channel goes, like, by the way, we're not anti-religious, you know, we're just yeah. anti-control, anti-coercion, right. anti-abuse, um, we're all about whatever your consciousness is, um, but at the time, because I feel like you kind of are, in a way, anti-religious if you're atheist, because... Um, right. You're just um, not about that life. So I will say, though, that to Shalise's kind of leaning toward, like, the mystical, I kind of found a little bit of that pathway with my father when I was, like, as far as him showing me that kind of lifestyle when I was in my later teen years, which is kind of a magical way of thinking. But um, I think part of that still lingers with me a bit, and I think that's Mm -hmm. something that we kind of connected on. Um, But that said... I think I'm at a place now and have been for the last, I don't know, 15 years where pretty agnostic, which I think you and I, you're you're also, we were kind of, it's like you, yeah, you don't believe or disbelieve. You don't have proof, but you're not going to, because I was saying, we were talking about this yesterday. uh, You have to have the same amount of faith as a super religious person and as an atheist, because you're, you're still believing in something you cannot see. And I've had atheists be like, well, you don't have any evidence. And I'm like, Neither do you. <laughs> you know, I'm like, where, yeah. where's your evidence? So I feel like that's where I, I, I found peace in is just being agnostic, being okay with being like, you know what, I don't know. Yeah. But I also don't like the idea of like it being black, dark, yeah. darkness, we're just dead. I you sure know? hope something happens. I don't know about this whole celestial, terrestrial. <laughs> Telestial kingdom. Uh, extraterrestrial. <laughs> but um, I hope something happens for sure. Yeah. I hope we're able to kind of do a review of life and, and, um, I, I do hope that my, my favorite story of them all is the reincarnation one. I, yeah. I hope that's the right. Story. I know. I resonate with that. Like yeah. the, the bo- if I had to pick a belief, which yeah. I don't like to put a label on what I believe because I, I take pieces from it, yeah. what feels right. Buddhism <clears throat> makes a lot of sense and reincarnation and like feeling the mother earth. Right. Mm-hmm. But um, like, how did we know Amanda Ray in a different life that could be happening concurrently with this life? Yes. Yeah. What is time? Right. It's all exactly. Yeah. I like all of these. And, and to believe we like what you're saying, we're human. We are not going to know. There's no way to research the the afterlife or like the, I don't know, soul aspect of things because we are in this human experience right now. I like to believe, um, I think Jim Carrey said this actually. He's like on the spiritual journey right now, but he said, uh, and maybe other people have said this too, but I saw on his Instagram, we are souls having a human experience, mm-hmm. not humans, you know. Yeah. So it's really like about... I don't know. There's a reason why us humans keep wanting to talk about what happens when we die. Cause like there, it's almost like this in my belief, it's, it's because we know there's something more, but yeah. we, we just can't put our finger on it. Cause we're in this human like matrix. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Yeah. No, I agree. And on the subject of reincarnation, you might find it funny that I did a TV show. I was also on a reality show, but on a few, some are more embarrassing than others, but this one specifically was on reincarnation. Someone just yesterday commented, Oh my gosh, guess what was recommended to me? And I saw you on the screen was like, wait a second. I know this person. So I was cast to go and get hit 
hypnotized and they took me back through a regression to past lives. No. Guys, I thought I was making it up. I was like, I'm freaking crazy. I got a vivid imagination. I don't even know what I'm saying. It felt real. Mm -hmm. It felt not like a dream. It's like I was there and I was re-experiencing it and I was crying at some points. I was like drowning at one point in my heart rate. They had a thing on my finger literally went up to 160 and I'm just laying in a chair because in the reincarnation I was drowning. So one of your lives died by drowning? Yes. Do you have a fear of water now? I have a kind of fear of the ocean and that's where I drown. Really? Yeah. Wow. I would not know. She's the most adventurous person, which was a pleasant su <laughs> surprise as we started traveling our first year. She's the type that will purposely try to push herself to beyond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like so it's because you've only seen me swimming in like beautiful tropical waters where I can see the bottom. I have this kind of fear of the deep blue sea, like out in the middle of the sea where if you're out there, you're probably going to drown. And it was in, it was a shipwreck in a storm. So it was like a whole thing. But anyway, what's crazy is we came back for the reveal where they have all of these people doing the research and they put in front of me the people in the places that I mentioned like, I said I was um, a sailor in 18-something, like 1840 in Baybeck, England. What? They literally found the person that I said his name and his wife's name, and they found it in census records in that time frame in a place called Baybeck, England. Oh, my god! And he gosh. was in the – like, the whole thing so lined up. call that proof? Probably, because or where else is that coming bias? from? How that can't be confirmation <laughs> bias because I don't I didn't even know that I didn't know that was a place. And then another one, Bybeck. You just said Bybeck, a random was, place. No, retroactive. Where like they make it happen to co to coincide oh, with your story. Oh, you think they? I mean, it's a fabricated show. evidence, mm -hmm. maybe. But in another one, so I did it twice. I did it once, um, and then they called me the next day and they're like, "Can you come back and do it again?" I was like, "I guess I did something right." So they made it seem like it was one session, but I just wore the same thing two different days. Mm -hmm. So I went back the first time to a woman in where was it it was somewhere in the middle east um can't remember exactly but it was like in the year 1000 or something crazy and i couldn't have kids and i was infertile and i was called all these names and people would throw food at me and i was like the devil to them because i was not doing what women should do my parents couldn't pass down any land they were super rich and hated me because all of their stuff just disappeared when they died like they on their deathbed they hated me it was this whole thing i just want to say i'm sorry for what you went through when you were in a different life in Thanks, year babe. 1000 <laughs> but what's crazy is i was infertile and when i went to do this regression the day before i had donated my eggs and so they really felt, I mean, it's TV. They just latched onto that so hard. And they were like, she compulsively donates her eggs and doesn't know why. I'm like, it's not that serious. But I did find <laughs> the connection funny. interesting that in one life I couldn't have kids. And then in another life I'm trying to help women have kids. Yeah. And then they said that I spoke ancient Arabic. And so they're like, what do your prayers sound like? And I had mumbled something. And they were like, yeah, we talked to experts. And they said you were speaking ancient Arabic. And I'm like, that's cool. And they also found what they called me and like the place i don't know it Whoa. was pretty cool i like want to do this now because <laughs> i do i think that that makes a lot of sense because when i was super religious i was like it doesn't make sense that we get one shot to go to heaven because like i don't know what it's like to be um have people be racist against me i mean i kind of did in the order because i had darker skin than the white kids oh my <laughs> but gosh really? yeah they called me the n-word what because of my skin tone i was like this chick hey, like, what? you couldn't be more like that's what I, I am scan <laughs> half Scandinavian, <laughs> but I, I think I wasn't the shade of white that they wanted. Wow. And I literally, I remember my sister helping me bath and she's like, you're just dirty. And she's like trying to scrub my skin because she didn't All like right. that I was getting bullied for my color oh of my, my skin. Gosh. Sorry, that was like so random. But like my point was like, how can you only get one try? Like, I don't know what it was like to be, you know, someone who's having all this prejudice. Like, I don't know what it's like to be a man. I don't know what it's like. So how can I be a woman born in the order? And that was my one chance on this earth, mm -hmm. you know? Sure. Yeah. So I like the idea of the reincarnation. And but well, I also like the idea that it's not even for some sort of brownie points in heaven. It's not like you get a redo and you get to try again and be a better person this time. I like the idea of soul progression, of just learning for the sake of learning, for experience, for the sake of experience. There's always mm -hmm. like 
the magical side of thinking and the pragmatic side. So the pragmatic side of that would be like, well, of course we would feel like that would be awesome because that would give a purpose, meaning, purpose to our life that yeah. we can actually pull something from this and it mm-hmm. isn't just a random set of events that's yeah. just happening that are going to just end. And um, yeah, not only that, but that we would have, um, like, we're making a mountain out of a molehill. Like, not only is this life important, it's part of a bigger puzzle piece <laughs> of a whole other thing yeah. that has a greater arc. Which might not be true either. Yeah. But what we like to talk about and what we bonded on on, like, our fourth date was that we don't really know and it's okay. And I like to lean toward the side of magical thinking because it makes life more magical. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't control me to the sense of, like, oh, no, I did something wrong and I'm putting out the wrong energy and that's going to come back to me yeah. and I'm worried about it and it's a whole thing or we can't get married on this day because the cosmos are not aligned in the correct way. It doesn't control our lives, but mm-hmm. it does make it more interesting and more fun and right. it makes conversations more fun. And so... Like you were saying, we take what resonates and we leave the rest. And if one day it feels really weird to think about reincarnation and I want to drop that idea, then I will. And that's okay because it's okay to change your belief system when you get new information. And that's one thing that I learned after leaving a cult is when you're in a cult, the rules are the rules and you Mm -hmm. can't question it. And so it blocks critical thinking. So when you leave being open to things and saying yeah I don't really know but this might be the case is such a healthy way of living because you're constantly able to take in new information and you can change your mind and it's okay to change your mind yeah Yeah. no I think uh the key word there is control too because we often talk about with cults is someone controlling you but that's such an interesting point of view that you're bringing up is not letting anything control you, yeah. not just the right. person. Ideology but, yeah, too. Even ideology, yeah. Yeah, and anything can get overwhelming and controlling. Even politics can get controlling where you put yourself in a box and you say, I only believe this, this, and this, and right. I won't listen to anything else that's because... That's true confirmation bias. Yeah. yeah, and so I think it's just important to be open-minded and mm-hmm. to see the sides of everyone and see new perspectives and be willing to change your mind because that's a huge thing. People are so stubborn and they're like, no. This My is way the way is the it right is. way. And they don't realize they're in the way of their own happiness a lot of yeah. the time. Sadly. Yeah. They're yeah. closing off themselves to new relationships and friendships and worldviews because they're so stubborn in I am right, I am right, I am right. But now I'm interested. You were talking about your first dates. What attracted you both to each other? You you did say, I think on the live that you guys met on Hinge. Did you say that on the we live? We did. Okay, yeah. You met on Hinge uh-huh. and then your first few dates, was it instant? Was it something that you felt I'm just so curious the process. Well, it definitely clicked. So we clicked on a few different levels. I am a salsa dancer. It's something that I love. I grew up dancing. It's probably a Utah thing. But he saw a video of me salsa dancing on my Hinge profile. And he's like, did I just find my next salsa partner? And I rolled my eyes because every guy says they can salsa and they usually can't. You're like, whatever. (laughs) And so so on our first date, we actually did dance with the the car door open to a bachata song. It's very romantic. And that was part of our first dance at our wedding. And so... I think everything culminated together where we connected intellectually, we shared really deep things on our first date, conversations I talked about, a little bit of trauma as far as, yeah, I felt like I wanted to be a dancer because I wanted to be seen and people weren't really hearing me and it was a way to express myself freely without getting punished for it. And so he was kind of like, oh, wow, that's interesting. That's, I resonated with that a lot yeah. too. Yeah, and I resonated with his creativity and how he's creative but also pragmatic, which is hard to find in somebody. Usually they're business minded too, because right. those are two like left brain yeah. things. Yeah. So it's mm-hmm. hard to find people that are both creative and finance right. driven. Yeah. Because it's like it's and structured. And structured to find the, the blend of those two. It's it's a it's really nice when you meet someone that that shares the same sentiments with that. Right. Yeah. Because both of us do have both of those sides. Mm-hmm. And so that clicked the creative the structure, the successful nature of like, we want to build something and just like, I mean, everything, the physical connection was there when, um, when I fell into your arms dancing, I was like, Oh, this is nice. He's so swung. (laughs) This feels good. Hmm. 
Because <laughs> when I, um, sorry, I'm going to bring up a little story with, because I was saying there's only like five couples that I've seen and I've, I've been like, okay, I'm looking up to these couples as an example. And I really like your guys' relationship, which is why I'm trying to go into the depths of the background for viewers and for myself. One of those people, though, in the five that I look up to is Jessica. She's on the show. Mm -hmm. You guys have probably seen her on Escaping Polygamy. Her and her husband, Todd. And I asked her, I was like, how did you know? And she felt this, like, w like in his arms, feeling safe yeah. and feeling very, like, this is my person. And I hated hearing that. I'm like, so I'm just supposed to know, like, when, I, <laughs> when he holds me that he's the one. Yeah. But I think there really is something deep that, yeah. I mean, you guys experienced it. And yeah. we can also get a little personal, if you don't mind, babe. Um, while we're speaking, because we talked about the purity culture thing, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to understanding yourself and your body, the first time we had sex, it was like magic. I remember mm. it was a full body yes for me. My body was like, this is the guy that we want to let in and we feel safe yeah. and this is amazing. And I was like, that was a oh, yeah. Thing? Totally, totally, totally. Yep. I mean, of course, it felt good. It was sex, but it was like I think next it's so level. much right. It's so much better when you have an emotional yes. connection. So many people, I feel like, live their whole life not even experiencing that. Right. They don't realize like sex is sex, whatever. Yeah. But that's the thing is, I hadn't experienced that before because yeah, I'd had great sex and awesome, cool, but it was totally different. It was like my mind, body, and soul all mm -hmm. coming together in one, saying. Yes. Aww. What's interesting about the top, just the sex, the act of sex, is that it's, it's so, it's, it can be used for good and bad, right? Mm -hmm. It's like in the, the topic of cults, I mean, it's used in, in bad ways. Mm -hmm. you know, like men that want to essentially abuse women and children for their own sexual gain, for their own uh, feeling of power, their own validation. Um, but when used the right way, which is to have this connection with a partner, um, yeah, it can be transcendent, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, I didn't re really know that it was that um, it, powerful Helpable. for you, <laughs> um, but just how your own body knows, you know, from, mm -hmm. yeah. because one of the things that we talk about, because at this point now we've done two lives, one on each channel, mm -hmm. and then we recorded a video. So make sure to go watch that video. After <laughs> you're done watching you guys video. got a lot of stuff to get through. <laughs> but um, intuition is, is a big theme that we talk that we've been talking about and how uh, whether it's like a woman that kind of intuitively knows, like in your case, uh, when you're being cheated on, mm -hmm. or um, in your case, you know, when your body just knows intuitively, um, yes, this is right. You know. Yeah, because you were talking about how do you know that it's a safe place and everything? How do you know it's the right guy? When I met him, and we talked about this earlier, I don't know which conversation it was, but we're talking about how is it too good to be true? When's yeah. the other shoe going to drop? And so I was feeling that initially because everything just kind of fell into place. But then when we had that physical connection, that's when I was like, oh, no, this is the right deal. This is it. Yeah. Because everything came together and made sense. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the hell yes moment for me when I was just like, oh, I'm connecting with him in this spiritual way and mm -hmm. allowing myself to have a spiritual experience when, as you know, I've been shamed so much for having sex, shamed so much for not even having sex, right? Shamed for stupid things that were attached to my sexuality. And so to be in a place where I could celebrate my sexuality because we weren't married and I was, it was fine. It was like, wow, I've had this incredible experience. And had we not had that experience, I still might have been waiting for the other shoe to drop wondering, am I just falling into something because it feels good? And is it another pattern? Is it going to be toxic again? Mm -hmm. But allowing myself to reconnect with my body in such a way that allowed it, allowed it to come up and say, hey, I'm talking to you and I need you to pay attention. I think that's next level when you're able to get to that point. Sounds like you with him were able to heal more. Yeah. He yeah. helped you in your healing journey. Yeah. Without and even trying. <laughs> I do remember when you first expressed um, past traumas. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know how much we're going to get into that. But um, yeah, I mean, immediately I was crying. You know, so it I think, was really sweet. I think it was like our first week of knowing each other. And she's telling me the story. The story and it was so traumatic that it just... My face started just swelling leaking. Up and, uh, leaking. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, the more and more I dated over the years, I realized how many women have been like something has happened to them sexually. Yeah. yeah. Um, to a point where I stopped being surprised. It was almost like, 
I would meet someone new and I, I would already kind of know just like, yeah, so, you know. What's who, the trauma? Yeah, what's yeah. the trauma? What happened to you? Who, who did this to you mm. when you were in some college dorm room or what happened to you when you were a kid? Um, so sexually. sad, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that speaks volumes of the dynamics between men and women just as a whole. And the niche of cults is so interesting because it kind of puts a magnifying glass and it exacerbates mm-hmm. those those topics. Um, yeah, so to go to the counter of that, when you have, um, I think the, the word that comes is love. You know, it's like not just when you find a connection with somebody and then you allow yourself to, because uh, I do think love is, is a choice. You know, I'm, I'm allowing myself to, uh, be in love with this person mm-hmm. and, and be conditional, you know, oh, right. or yeah. unconditional, unconditional, yeah, like no matter what. Um, and I'm choosing that, but also, you know, you're talking about your body and, and, and being okay with accepting this person. It's like, there's a lot of self love that goes with like, you deserve yeah. that. You, yeah. mm-hmm. you're okay to be, let yourself be vulnerable in that sense. Right. Mm-hmm. I think a big part is that, that safety you're talking about, you felt safe to be vulnerable with him yeah. and you could have that together. You, I don't think you can have a real, relationship without that right to be able to be safe enough to be vulnerable but then you guys i think because you had this connection so quickly things happen really fast like you guys are married you guys got engaged how quickly after eight months eight months eight months it's been two years we just made a two-year date anniversary yeah wow yeah and see a lot of people like like i remember hearing them like whoa that is so fast but then it's like when you know you know yeah there's no point in really waiting i've been super interested though to, to ask your guys's opinion on like because now that you're married, do you guys talk about having kids? How would you raise your kids based mm-hmm. on everything about religion that we've just talked about? Yeah. Yeah. So my thing is I want to teach my kids about all religions and just say, this is what's out there in the world. And I want you to be aware of what Mormons believe. And I want you to be aware of what the Buddhists believe. And and these are the things that I like from each of those. And they mm-hmm. do all have good things. But know that mom doesn't subscribe to any of them in but particular. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I Good think luck. teaching them, teaching them that it's okay to take what resonates and leave the rest, mm-hmm. because I don't want them to be surprised one day if a missionary shows up at their door, charming and handsome and cute and nineteen, and like sweep them off their feet, and then they are whisked into this lifestyle. Of course, I want to be a supportive parent and not be like, no, you can't join the Mormons. But I think by teaching them at a young age what's out there, it allows them to critically think about all of the options. And we can still teach them morality and values and all of the good things that people say you need religion for. I think you can Mm -hmm. get without the guilt and the shame and the going to hell part. So I think just when you can educate them on everything they aren't stuck to a belief system where they blind out everything else and they're just tunnel visioned in on, well, mom says that this is the way to go and so I'm never going to question it. I think questioning is amazing. Questioning is human nature. That's how we Mm -hmm. get anything done is by asking questions. How can we make the world better? How can we make life easier? And if you stop that critical thinking and that questioning, there they're going to be stunted. Their yeah. growth will stop. Uh, so wait, you're not Mormon? <laughs> Since when? <laughs> I thought we were raising our kids Mormon this whole time. I would so, lose my mind. So I do? love you so much. I think I would have to divorce you if you, you if you <laughs> turned Mormon on me. I think I would be like, whoa. We hold, can stay friends. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, a, that's a line for that's her. A, that is a hard line. Can you imagine we're like, cultivating this channel it's like, and, and then, then I'm secretly like I'm going to convert her to be LDS yeah. that would be wild wait like, what's your break because we I think we talked about this on the live where he was like okay with a Christian girl but then yeah. when you yeah. were really asking him he's like okay you're right you're maybe right, you're right. not yeah <laughs> what was the question what she just said, like, she's going to give. Is that basically the same answer? Like, you're going to give them all these options, but yeah. you you both have the same kind of standing. We don't know, but... I like the idea. I'm totally on board with the critical thinking thing, raising kids that are critical thinkers. I think um, the, the pillars of virtue that I would like to instill is, like, the virtue of being creative and mm-hmm. self-expression. Compassion is a big one. Right. Uh, critical thinking is another one where we can... Um, teach them how to think for themselves to a point where it's like, um, I think another word is like awareness, like making them aware of various cultures and and, um, ideologies. But you, you you know, this goes ironically, the whole Jesus quote of like, teach a man how to fish. Don't teach them, you know, don't catch the fish for them. 
we're going to show you the way about how to be the, the best critical thinker. And then all we can do is just provide a bunch of insight, right. our own personal insight. And then mm -hmm. do what you, you're going to do what you're going to do anyway. Mm -hmm. right. All we can do is arm you with the best ways of approaching things. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm totally on board with the critical thinking thing. Yeah. Too. And the family values and being honest and doing good things because you want to be a good person, not, not because you're afraid of hell, heaven. not because or, you yeah, want to go true. to heaven. So just being a good person for the sake of being a good person and also teaching cause and effect because I think a lot of people, we talked about this on one of the lives where they're like, well, if you don't teach a child about heaven and hell, how are they going to do good things or how are you going to keep them from sinning or whatever it is? And I think it's simple, just teaching them about cause and effect. Right. If you do this negative thing, this is going to be the consequence. It, it can be a consequence here now, like a physical, tangible consequence, mm -hmm. not some sort of salvation thing that we don't even know is going to happen or not like, I, I overheard you guys earlier talking about pregnancy it's like yeah you don't you have sex early on you don't use birth control or anything you, you could get pregnant mm -hmm. you could these get an outcomes. sti yeah these are the outcomes mm -hmm. and now that you are educated on what could happen you can make the best educated decision right not me saying well don't have sex because it's a sin and you'll go to hell if you do that they're probably going to do it anyway because that also doesn't give them any tangible ideas of, well, it's not going to happen now, so maybe I can repent later. Mm -hmm. It just it doesn't leave any room for themselves to figure things out. Right. It's so it's so interesting to see. Like, I am seeing my younger self when Jessica was explaining to me how she was going to raise her kids because I loved asking this question as I left the cult because I'm like, I don't even know what I'm going to teach my kids because I don't even yeah. know what I believe. But when she told me, she gave me an analogy, she was like, you're reminding me so much of Jessica. <laughs> and I looked up to her so much. I still do. Like she gave me so much hope that I was going to be able to heal and, and come through all of this because she has kids now and she does really great with her family. But she gave me this analogy of, I'm going to tell my kids, like, a flower that's growing, like, how is this flower here? Well, some people believe that God put this flower here. Some people believe that the, you know, Mother Earth, like, she's going to give them all the, the ideas, basically what you're saying, and mm -hmm. let them decide. And I remember having, like, a crisis. Like, you cannot let this child decide. The child doesn't <laughs> know. Yeah. But in reality, like, now that I've evolved and I've healed and I've learned and grown, um, not having that trust in your kid is the worst thing you can do. And like making all the decisions for them and coddling them is the worst thing you can do. Because like we were saying, you're going to keep having to catch that fish for them yeah. because they don't know how to do it themselves. Yeah, actually, I love that analogy. We should use that because then the pragmatist or the realist would be like, that flower's there because someone planted it. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like giving them all of the options and be like, what feels right to you? Do you right. think God put it here? Do you think it just grew on its own, you know? There's so many lessons that are real world tangible lessons mm -hmm. that are so beneficial to kids instead of just saying eternal consequences. Yeah. And honestly, like seeing Jessica's kids now is so cute. We were talking about how um, someone in their class was religious, one of the little girls, and they were like, God is in the sky. And then Jessica's girl was like, I've been in an airplane and I've never seen God. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but I it makes, that. like, I could picture, like, I would be so proud of my kid that they're using their critical thinking exactly. and they're, instead of, like, shaming that. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's a, that's their superpower. I'm going to be excited to see, do you guys talk about, like, how many kids you guys want? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely two, maybe three. That's yep. where we're at with things, yeah. It depends mm -hmm. on the timing of things. Um, right. I have always been of the mentality that I don't want to have more kids that I could put, I want to be able to appropriately allocate energy to them. Right. So I feel like once you start having a lot, you're just kind of, the, the, oh, the yeah. quality of what you can give is, is thinner, right? Like my mom had 10 kids and I, I did this, um, I was researching that you have to give your kids physical affection for what, 30 minutes a day? Like my oh. mom would have oh, been. Oh, there's like an actual a time, yeah, okay. that kids need their love tank. <clears throat> I don't know where they got that from, but then I was like, my mom would have been hugging us for like hours a day. There's no way we could have gotten the right amount us ten kids. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I thought about this more, and as I've gotten older, I'm like, two, same thing, two, maybe four, because I I like the idea of like two best friends. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, cute. Yeah. But I think, I mean, did you guys want to add anything else on ending this? Well, if I had to button it up, it would be follow your intuition, mm -hmm. take what resonates, leave the rest. It's okay to change your mind, and you are worthy. Oh, I like that. What about you? Nice. <laughs> um, I I want to go a different route. I want to thank you for your I mean, mission in life. I oh feel babe, like that's so good. I want to thank Amanda <laughs> too. Can I restart? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like um, you know now that we've done four four videos here in a short period of time 
Um, I, I'm fascinated with your arc, um, the, your navigation through your journey, um, how you, to go off of you, what you're saying about intuition, how you've utilized your intuition throughout, whether it's been bad relationships or the order itself, mm -hmm. or how you were visualizing yourself escaping polygamy at the mm -hmm. time <laughs> and then with your subsequent divorce and and the entire time your through line has been that you've seen yourself as a megaphone as an amplifier mm -hmm. of um you know follow your intuition and um if it doesn't feel right it's probably not right get out of it so you help a lot of people and uh, i want to thank you for that yeah, yeah. you guys too though thank, thank you, you guys you guys have the same whole mission and it's very i feel like it's inspired so many people too i mean we need more people to be able to be vulnerable publicly it's hard it's not easy <laughs> so. yeah i was just gonna say guys if you are watching and following amanda's channel leave those amazing supportive comments because it is incredibly hard what we do especially her because she mostly talks about her story i pepper in parts of my story but it's usually about the guest but when you have a channel that is literally diving into your traumas it's a lot and so leaving those encouraging words is one of the main things that keeps us going when we realize it's oh, helping yeah. people or even just a simple thank you so much for your time it really makes a difference so don't forget to do that for your girl here because it's a lot of work it does mean a lot i've had i'm not joking i've cried reading your guys's nice comments mm. and they've, they've been what's got me through the day because i did i left my whole community behind and it wasn't just like see you later it was like you're dead to us yeah. so the fact that you guys have given me this community like i'm so grateful for it yeah and if you do want to leave comments like questions down below we i feel like we're gonna do some more videos oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so put comments down below and questions and we'll we'll see if we can put another video together with all cool. of us thank you so much for watching and thank you guys for being a part of this thank you and i'll see you guys on sunday bye, bye.